know if you want, but I have two short pieces. Yes, of course. Is that all right? Absolutely. Yeah, okay. And I'm going to... You have prepared loads, Marion, because I knew you would, so i let you do your... Well, it's just a reading, really. That's well, perfect. That okay? That's absolutely perfect. Yeah. Yeah, have I you got titles done. of them? Have you titles? Yes. Or? Yes, I'll let you crack on that. Right, okay. Um, what, oh, yeah. Well, one of them's called Grocer's Apprentice about my father going to serve his time in Enskill. So are you recording these? I'm recording it now. Oh Lord, right, okay. Just now. Okay. So, and with the second one, uh, Ben the Lech Band goes to London. And I have got just a little paragraph given the background. Would I read that out? Yes, so basically, we can edit this at any time. So basically, whatever one you take first, if you say the title, a little summary about it, and then do your reading. Right, okay. Okay. Would you look, I'll start with this one. Don't worry, you can start and stop. I know that. And we can edit it, don't worry. And if I fluff anything, I'll pause and then start And then just start again. Yeah, that'll be better. I'm used to that. Okay, right. So... As an old photograph taken around 1912 attests, there's been a band in Belnalec associated with the Orange Lodge there since before the First World War. For years it was a flute band, but around the late 1940s they decided to take a step up in the world and change to the Scottish bagpipes. It wasn't an easy transition, especially for the old stagers, but with the help of the late George Stewart as pipe major, they duly managed it. The pipe band went from strength to strength. They acquired kilts, measured up and supplied by the late Gordon Wilson of Enniskillen. And in June 1960, we're very proud to accept an invitation to lead the House of Commons Orange Lodge in a parade in London. The trip is still talked about as one of the great events in the parish's history. So, Belnalec Band goes to London. The transition from the old flute band to the bagpipes wasn't easy. You could dip your flute in the water, butt on your way out, and that would be you ready to play. But preparing the pipes involved a lengthy ritual. New skin bags had to be played in. Then it was a constant battle to keep them airtight. A messy procedure where you dripped syrup of treacle into the bag and massaged it. Then it was a constant battle to keep them airtight, a messy procedure where you dripped syrup or treacle into the bag and massaged it from the outside. The stink on a hot day was desperate, and as sure as not, the bag leaked, making you a target for wasps. The most critical part of the piper's armoury is his lips. If you hadn't practised, your lips would just give up. You can blow like blazes, but the air would whistle uselessly down the outside of the pipe stock. Now, by the 12th of July 1952, Belnalec Pipe Band had perfected one tune. King William's March, by the left, quick march. A preliminary groan from the drones as left elbows punched bags into life, and off they set, playing, what else, King William's March then time for a break. So they'd walk for a bit to a single drum beat. Then somebody would shout, what do we play this time boys? What about King William's March would come the reply. And so it went on up and down the hollows and humps of Enniskillen's long main street. When the band eventually progressed to getting a proper uniform, nothing less than full highland dress would do. The ancient Calhoun tartan, blue, green and red, Each kilt with its nine yards of cloth weighed a ton. For a crowd of farmers abandoning their trousers was some adventure, but how in hell were they going to get them to stay up? Braces with skirts. A nappy pin could help hitching the kilt to the tail of your shirt. White spats, sporrans, a busby apiece for the pipe major and the big drummer, Glengarry's for the rest, and the uniform was complete. Some years later it came an invitation to travel to London to lead the House of Commons Orange Lodge in its annual parade. The prospect was awesome. Oh, but it would be June, hay time. Who was going to do the milking? Well, the women would have to manage. 
They had mastered tunes like the barren rocks of Aden and the Chiltern Hundreds with burls and hindrums and throws to ornament them, but a soberer piece would be required for the march past the Cenotaph. It was much harder to sustain a slow tune, but with great effort and, it is said, much effing and blinding, they learned Lord Lovett's Lament. At four o'clock in the morning on Sunday the 19th of June 1960, the band set out for Nuts Corner Airport. They were already in full regalia as they bundled drums and pipes onto the waiting bus. And as they jigged along the potholed road, somebody, fearing for the drums, remarked, Well, damn the spring is in her. You might as well be bucking along in the trailer after the tractor. None of them bar one had flown before. Many were nervous and getting sweatier by the minute in their nine yards of kilt and high button jackets. Willie Thornton had made sure to get a seat at the back. How's that Willie? Well now you never saw a plane reversing into a mountain yet. Albert Crozier was nonplussed when the air hostess offered coffee. Having never tasted it, how the blazes would he know whether he preferred black or white? And so they arrived. The morning passed in a haze of excitement and a preliminary tour of the sights to observe the Queen's cows grazing in the grounds of Windsor Castle was grand, but the most amazing moment was when someone spotted Pazzy Paddy. But the most amazing moment was when someone spotted Paddy Brazel from Enniskill and Wheel in a Barrow along the street, boys a dear, and it the Sabbath. The band formed up at Horse Guards Parade. The procession took off. Spread out the width of the mile, they could hardly hear each other playing and to add to the anxiety at the back of their minds, they worried would they even recognise the cenotaph, their cue to play the solemn lament. But when the moment came, they swelled to it, turning in unison for the reverential eyes right. It felt indeed like their finest hour. After almost exactly 24 hours of non-stop travel, the band arrived back in Bendelec at first light. The plaintive strains of Lord Lovett's lament were still ringing in their ears, but that would soon be replaced by the sound of the cows roaring to be milked. Very good. Is that okay? That's brilliant. Oh. <laughs> anyway, I fluffed a few things. No, that's absolutely no. That's amazing. That's is very it, good. Is it, is it's it suitable. Material? Oh, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. That's a brilliant story. No, that's exactly what we want, Marion. Well, good. No, that's great. <laughs> yeah, uh, but it's really hard though when somebody says, "Right, go." <laughs> uh, <laughs> isn't it? But you, you're used to that sort of thing. But it well, is, it is hard, yeah, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, it is yeah, hard. Yeah. It is. So the but other that's one brilliant. is shorter. Even to right, okay. Yeah, so I'll remember to separate out the sheets this time. And there's a band just in queue oh, there. Yeah, they're obviously they're coming back from the, the town. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, right. So what am I going to say here? Um, <laughs> Distract me. Uh, right. Uh, This is a piece I've called The Apprentice Grocer and it tells about my father George Blackheart's experience of coming to Enniskillen to serve his time in a high class grocer's shop in 1925. October 1925, the first traffic lights were installed in Piccadilly Circus in Luxor, the mummified body of King Tutankhamun was unwrapped after 3,000 years to reveal the face of a 15-year-old boy. Josephine Baker was setting Paris alight, slapping her buttocks in Temple Two. Josephine Baker was setting Paris alight, slapping her buttocks in Temple Two. Yes, sir, that's my baby. At Thatcher's grocer's shop in Grantham, a blue-eyed baby daughter, Margaret, first saw the light of day. 
and at Cathcart and McDonald's high class grocers in Enniskillen, a new life dawned for a young apprentice to the trade. My father was just six weeks short of his 14th birthday, the October day his mother muffled him up and pressed the first of the weekly half crowns into his hand. Her heartfelt warning against ever playing cards, driven home again by reference to the gambling uncle and his sighting of the devil's cloven hoof under the table. His father harnessed the pony and trap and took him down the long lane and then the ten miles into Enniskillen. It was the boy's first time ever to see the island town and when his father turned the pony westward back across the west bridge he went and had a good cry out in the yard. As the cub he learnt from the bottom up how to weigh up, tap down and close bags of sugar so that you couldn't tell which end had been open, how to parcel groceries in brown paper for it was an insult how to parcel groceries in brown paper, it was an insult to give them out in a box. How to break twine with your bare fingers, how to wring a chicken's neck up in the loft and be able to land it on the counter in minutes, plucked and still twitching. The customer is always right, was the supreme commandment and indeed, it was the shop's customers that provided a country boy with a window on posher ways. The gentrified whiff of cigar that presaged the arrival of the Honourable Cecil would at his very command give way to the smell of coffee beans roasting. Businessmen's wives would discuss the state of their golf. Yet in all, his heart was in farming and he loved to be sent on an errand through the town on a fair day to witness the spit and slap of bargains being struck and memorise the banter of the camp boys selling their wares. The hours were long, but there were compensations. Letty the housekeeper fed the men like fighting cocks, and Big Jack McCourt took the cub under his wing, letting him man the tiller of his rowing boat for the long row down to Devonish Island on summer evenings for a swim. He practised eking out his weekly half-crown, lemonade for tuppence, an orange for a penny, five pence for a pit seat in the town hall to see the silent pictures. One particular night at the pictures provided him with a favourite story. Also in the audience, glued to Tom Mix and his wonder horse Tony, was Johnny Convey. Now Johnny was in receipt of an infirmity pension, having succeeded in persuading the doctor to sign a form saying he was effectively blind. Seated nearby in the cinema, Johnny spotted the official who had interviewed him for the pension. And quick as a wink, he leans over to him and he whispers, I wonder, sir or madam, w- would this be the right bus for Bundorn? <laughs> when, at 17, he finished his apprenticeship, my father had earned not a penny. But he had riches the bejeweled boy King Tutankhamun never possessed all the skills of a high-class grocer and enough stories to entertain his customers for the next 50 years.